This video is supported by CuriosityStream. I did a video earlier this year that looked at the idea of putting up space shades to block the sun and cool the planet. It was, uh, it was an eye-opening exercise. Because it turns out that in order to launch the kind of square meterage necessary to block even only 2% of the sun's light, we're to acquire 791 Starship launches a day for 10 years. Just a ridiculous number of launches, each of which would put 2,683 tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, which kind of defeats the purpose. Sadly, and amazingly, when you add up all those launches over the course of the year, the amount of CO2 emissions that produces is almost the same as what the current airline industry produces. So as we've begun the process of electrifying our automotive transportation, it's led a lot of people to ask, could we do the same for our air transportation? And that sounds like a great idea. There is, however, one thing that's holding up our transition to electric air transportation. It's called the laws of physics. Electric airplanes have actually been around since the 50s in the form of model airplanes, but it wasn't until 1973 that the first manned electric flight was done. It was designed by a guy named Fred Malitke, who was the chief engineer at Gropner, a company that made model airplane kits. His aircraft, the MBE-1, used power from nickel-cadmium batteries to reach a height of 300 meters, and the maiden flight lasted about 9 minutes long. Some sources say about 11 minutes. The point is, Malitke was an innovator, but his invention was held back by the, the technology of the time. After the flight, Maliki wrote, it is up to battery manufacturers whether they'll be able to produce even better batteries that are also lighter and make electric flying accessible to a wider public. He was really throwing down the gauntlet with that one, but his, his challenge made sense. In order for electric airplanes to ever be a thing, they needed much more capable battery supplies. And a lot of progress has been made since then. Today's lithium ion batteries are 30 to 40% more powerful than nickel cadmium batteries, and even those nickel cadmium batteries today are better than what they had back in Maliki's day. And that's a good start, but it's not enough if we're ever going to see electric air travel become the norm. Aviation is a huge business, and there's a vast infrastructure in place for it. That vastness of the industry means that big sweeping changes are going to take a long time to take place. In 2019, the global passenger air transport market was valued at $641.8 billion. The air freight market was valued at $116 billion. And they considered 2019 to be a bad year. That was, that was before 2020, of course. Bad has taken on a whole new meaning. Both passenger and freight air transport companies rely on the price of fuel to determine whether or not they make a profit. In fact, it's been called a self-disciplining industry because if the, if the cost of fuel is high, then the airlines have to fly tight. When fuel prices are low, you know, not so much. That's why generally it's public demand and regulations that tend to guide changes in the industry. Although there are segments of the aviation industry where electric power is the standard. Drones. Drones have always been electric. That's not always true with military drones, but uh, consumer and industrial drones, they've been electric pretty much across the board. And there are a ton of drones, over 1.7 million in the U.S. alone. And there's 200,000 drone pilots that are certified with the FAA. And yet I still don't have one. I've, I've never gotten a drone for some reason. So, it seems, all you have to do is just Scale up these drones, right? That's simple enough. Of course, it's a lot more complicated than that. Drones are actually a good example of the potential and the downfalls of electric flight. Because as amazing as they are in terms of technology, they still have really short flight times. Even the best consumer models can chew through their entire battery in 30 minutes. Now, there are some more advanced industrial drones that can fly for longer than that and some experimental models that can go for hours at a time. But these are the exceptions, and they're very expensive exceptions that can cost thousands of dollars, and they're still limited by their carrying capacity. Even Amazon, with billions of dollars in R&D, have been trying to get a drone delivery service going on for about seven years now and still haven't really been able to make it happen outside of some, some test runs in various local markets. Although the good news is that they recently were approved for flying in the U.S., but they're limited to 30-minute flights at 15-mile radiuses and can only carry five pounds or less. So the use case will be limited for sure, but I'm not, I'm not trying to be disparaging here. Amazon Prime Air drones are marvels of engineering. They're also a prime example of autonomous eVTOL technology, or eVTOL, that's electric vertical takeoff and landing. And this is a whole thing. There are hundreds of designs being tested and flown around the world right now. The designs range from piloted to autonomous to fairly mundane to sci-fi to just weird. NASA has a concept called the Puffin that's like a VTOL suit you just kind of put on. 
Omni Hoverboards has a creatively named Prototype 2 that's like a Segway in the sky. And then there's the Flying Bathtub by the Real Life Guys, which can best be described as... Well, uh, it's a flying bathtub. And as advanced as that flying bathtub looks, it can only fly for about six minutes right now. So yeah, flight time. It's a biatch. And it remains the biggest barrier to replacing fossil fuel aircraft. But there are some big names with some deep pockets that are working on breaking that barrier. Amazon, as I mentioned earlier, is one of them. One of the others is Uber, the ride-sharing company. They're actually working on an air taxi service called Uber Air. In 2019, they announced plans to put up sky ports in Dallas, Los Angeles, and Melbourne, with the idea being that an air taxi service would reduce traffic in urban areas. And at CES 2020, Hyundai unveiled a concept model for Uber Air called the UAM SA1. UAM stands for Urban Air Mobility, and SA1 stands for Let's Give It a Really Boring Name. It can carry five people, initially a pilot and four passengers, but they want to eventually make it fully autonomous. Plans were to make test flights this year, that's probably not going to happen at this point, but they still plan to launch a pilot service by 2023. And there's another service with plans to launch in 2023, I don't know why this is a popular year for this, but it's a German company called Volocopter. They have an air taxi service that they're calling Volo City. Get it? V Velocity? Respect. They're already taking reservations for it, but it's not meant to be a taxi service necessarily, not at first anyway, it's, it's more of a sightseeing tour. A 15 minute sightseeing tour for $355. So we're still pretty far from the flying cars of the Jetsons, but you know, I guess you gotta start somewhere. But Uber and Volocopter aside, a lot of companies have had trouble sticking with this whole air taxi service idea. Boeing and Airbus both had plans in the works, but they both have walked back from it recently with Boeing actually shutting down their UAM unit. And they both blame the pandemic for this, and granted, it's been a particularly hard year for any kind of airline business, but they already put significant money into research and development on this project, and it kind of makes you wonder if it's just a, some kind of fundamental business model problem. Not to mention other companies like Toyota and GM, they've also made significant investments in this that still haven't gotten off the ground, literally. So if even these massive companies with all their resources are struggling to make electric air travel happen, you kind of have to ask, are the problems really that hard to solve? To be honest, yeah, they kind of are. And frustratingly, the main problem is the same one that Fred Milicky ran up against 50 years ago, the whole energy density problem. Lithium-ion batteries are a huge improvement over nickel cadmium when it comes to energy density, but even that can't hold a candle next to gasoline. And by the way, don't hold a candle next to gasoline. It's, it's a bad idea. And refined jet fuel is even more energy dense than gas. Jet fuel has 45 to 90 times the energy density of lithium-ion batteries. Another way of putting it is electric airplanes have to carry at least 45 times the amount of weight in fuel as an equivalent jet plane. It's like running a race with an anchor tied to your back. And that weight never goes away. One huge advantage that fuel burning planes have is that they actually burn through thousands of gallons of fuel as they fly, so it actually gets lighter and more efficient the further they go. In fact, fully fueled jet planes are so heavy at the beginning of their flight that if they have to like make an early emergency landing, they need to dump their fuel because that extra weight could actually burst the tires. But at the end of normal trip, a fuel burning airplane would have burned off most of its fuel, so it would be light enough to not risk damaging the landing gear. An electric plane wouldn't have that luxury. It would still be just as heavy when it lands as it did when it took off. And that might make for some riskier landings. And another problem with electric planes is that they're all prop planes. There's no such thing as an electric jet. Now there are some theoretical electric engines that can compress the air until it combusts without the need for fuel, but those are still theoretical and experimental. Those are not in practice yet. Now it is possible for an electric prop engine to be as powerful as a jet engine, but again, there's the whole weight thing. An electric motor that powerful would add several tons to the equation. No jet engines also means a slower airplane. The fastest one ever designed so far is the Rolls-Royce Ion Bird, which has not actually flown yet, but it's designed to top out at 300 miles an hour. Compare that with a typical large airline that can cruise at 460 to 575 miles an hour. So electric planes are slow, they're heavy, they have short flight times, they can't carry that many people, and they might be more dangerous to land. Jet engines clearly went out on every metric. So why are we working on this again? Oh, right. The planet. Globally, the aviation industry contributes about 2.5% of all CO2 emissions, which actually comes out to all the countries of South America combined. And even with the drive for electrification that's going on right now, for all the reasons that I just said, there's no replacement for it. At least 
not one that matches the way we travel right now. Which means the best solution to this problem is probably the worst possible answer. We have to change our behavior. Remember Greta Thunberg and how she sailed across the Atlantic to speak at the UN instead of flying? Well, this is part of a whole cultural movement that's going on in Sweden right now known as Fleekskam. As in, I just flew in from Oslo and boy are my arms Fleekskam. Uh, Ryan wrote that joke, but you know what? If you're gonna walk up to that bell, I'm gonna ring it. Fleekskam literally translates to flight shame and the whole point of it is to get people to consider alternatives to long haul flying. Luckily, not all air travel is long haul flights. Take for example Harbor Air, they've been working to electrify their fleet over the last couple of years. They carry around 500,000 people annually on flights around the Pacific Northwest and most of their, their routes are really short, comparatively speaking. But then again, that's true of most flights. According to a Harbor business partner, quote, 75% of worldwide airline flights were 1,000 miles or less in 2018. What if we built a network of electric short haul flights that could meet our needs? At least 75% of it. The Norwegian Civil Aviation Authority is working on exactly that. If their plan goes forward, fully electric flights could soon be operating out of 16 airports to shuttle people around the country. An Israeli company called Eviation has developed a prototype nine passenger plane for the system with extra range to deal with bad weather. Now granted, carrying nine passengers a couple hundred miles at a time is not the fastest or most efficient way to get people around, and there's no real replacement for air travel over oceans or anything like that, so that means burning fossil fuels. This is turning out to be one of those difficult choices we may have to make when it comes to climate change. With the exception of offsetting the CO2 emissions by direct air capture or planting trees, this just might be something that we can't quite innovate our way out of. We might actually have to change our behavior. You know, the pandemic has already changed the way we travel, especially when it comes to business meetings. We do everything over video conference calls now, so, so maybe we'll just kind of get used to that. And instead of doing a lot of traveling, we'll just stay at home and work in our pajamas, which I'm doing right now. So who knows, if we combine less overall travel altogether with a network of short range electric planes and oh, here's an idea, a robust high speed rail network, maybe that'll be enough to make a significant difference. Then I'll set the rest with carbon sequestration and tree planting and whatnot. Maybe that'll be enough to get us there? Let me know what you think in the comments. And if you wanna get an up close and personal look at the challenges of designing and flying an electric aircraft, you might wanna check out the episode, Transportation of the Future, part of the Dream the Future series on CuriosityStream. Part of this episode follows the team of Didier Estain and Dominique Bonaire as they design their prototype plane, the E-Fan, with backing from Airbus. It goes in depth on those weight issues we talked about earlier and the various design and engineering tricks they use to get around it. And it might possibly give you a little hope for electric airplanes. The Dream the Future series is narrated by Sigourney Weaver and it examines what our future could look like from a variety of angles, from energy to food to work and more. And it's just one of thousands of awesome documentaries you can find on CuriosityStream, which has easily become one of my favorite streaming services. It was created by the guys who started the Discovery Channel, so this is kind of like what the Discovery Channel was meant to be. And if that isn't awesome enough, when you sign up for CuriosityStream, you get free access to Nebula, the streaming service that I'm a part of, as well as some of my favorite educational YouTubers, including Real Engineering, City Beautiful, Simon Clark, and Isaac Arthur. You can watch all of our content there ad-free, usually a little earlier than everybody else, and you get to see the Nebula original series that you can't see anywhere else. It's really a win-win if you want to support educational content because at Nebula we're not beholden to the YouTube algorithm so we can be more experimental, talk about topics that might be a little too spicy for YouTube advertisers. I've said before, it's kind of like signing up for a Patreon that supports dozens of channels. And right now CuriosityStream is offering a 26% discount. You can get a whole year of CuriosityStream and Nebula together for only $14.79 for two streaming services for a whole year. If you can find a better streaming service deal out there, I will shave my head. I mean, I won't, but you get the idea. So to sign up, just go to curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott, grab some hot cocoa, and dig in. I'll put the link down in the description. Big thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting this video, and a huge shout out to the Patreon members and the YouTube members that are supporting this channel. I want to call out some of the YouTube members that have signed up. Let me murder their names real quick. We got Karen Sheets, Heavy Horses, Michael Villani, Chris Wall, Catherine Galvez, uh, Kashinsky Kastuvavin, <laughs> sure. Uh, Philip Edgelers, uh, Alhim Ayari, Nick Lagola, and Palpik. 
murdered them. Uh, if you would like to join them, they do get access to uh, exclusive live streams, they get early access to videos, and you get a little emojis that kind of make you stand out in the comments, and it's pretty cool. I always make sure to respond to the, to the members as well. So you can do that just by hitting the little join button right underneath this video, and you're good to go. Please do like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, um, YouTube thinks you might like this one. It's probably another one of mine. There's others over here on the side that got my name on it, and if you do like them and you wanna see more, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.